This episode of Food Psych is brought to you by my online course, Intuitive Eating Fundamentals. If you're ready to break free from diet culture and reclaim the life it stole from you, learn more and sign up at christyharrison.com slash course. That's christyharrison.com slash course. Welcome to Food Psych, a podcast about intuitive eating, health at every size, body liberation, and taking down diet culture. I'm your host, Christy Harrison, and I'm an anti-diet registered dietitian, certified intuitive eating counselor, and author of the forthcoming book, Anti-Diet, Reclaim Your Time, Money, Well-Being, and Happiness Through Intuitive Eating, which is available for pre-order now. Join me here every week as I talk with interesting people from all walks of life about their relationships with food and their bodies. And by the way, on this show, we bleep out diet culture stuff like weight and calorie numbers, but we don't censor swear words or other adult language, so listener discretion is advised. Hey there, welcome to episode 207 of Food Psych. I'm your host, Christy Harrison, and today I'm talking with medical doctor and health at every size advocate, Louise Metz. It's always so exciting to talk to a medical doctor who specializes in health at every size because they are so sadly few at this point, but Louise is doing amazing work, and we talk about why weight management has no place in evidence-based health care, how our current medical system can get in the way of providing compassionate care, why it's actually not necessary for doctors to weigh their patients, how physicians can shift their practice to be more weight inclusive, and so much more. It's a great conversation. I really love this one, and I can't wait to share it with you in just a little bit. But first, I'll answer this week's listener question. And just a heads up that this one contains some explicit talk about poop. So if you're eating while listening to this and don't want to hear poop talk, you can always skip ahead to the interview and then come back to hear the Q&A later. The question is from a listener named Carla who writes, Dear Christy, first of all, I would like to express my gratitude for your podcast, not just because your words and ideas reach me personally, but because you're educating a whole new generation of people about accepting themselves and others around them. Your podcast has been quite helpful so far, but I do have a question that maybe you could help me out with as I feel this topic is not readily discussed still. I've been struggling with being a part of diet culture since I was probably five years old, and now I am 20. Along the way, I've suffered disordered eating and perhaps a form of binge eating disorder. I've been doing so, so much better in the last two years, but have one thing on my mind that causes me problems sometimes, which is digestion. It seems like once you notice your digestion getting messed up, as mine did during severe periods of restriction, you cannot put it out of your mind that easily anymore. I suffered constipation for some time during my eating disorder days, which I do not suffer today anymore, but I'm still highly aware of it. For example, my digestion works out quite well if I have my predictable daily routine, sleep enough, etc. But sometimes if it happens that I don't manage to go to the toilet as predicted, I feel like my whole day is not going well. And I also have different food preferences and sometimes even feel simply tired and down. I know it is not something I can force as bodies have their own wisdom, but I'd like to know how to cope with this uncertainty and lowered mood, especially when I'm traveling. I want to go out there in the world and explore as much as I can without being dependent on my digestive processes and worrying whether I'll be bloated, constipated, or something else. I know that this still might be a taboo topic on public platforms, but I feel like you're a person who could help. Kindest regards, Carla. So thanks, Carla, for that great question. And before I answer, just my usual disclaimer that these answers and this podcast in general are for informational and educational purposes only and aren't a substitute for individual medical or mental health advice. So yeah, this is such a great question, and it really is not discussed enough in our field. But I just want to empathize with your situation because I actually went through something really similar myself in the early days of my recovery. So I can feel your pain, and I know digestive discomfort is a big pain. I've shared here before on the podcast that I was diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome and also acid reflux, or GERD is the acronym for it, right around the time that I was in the worst of my disordered eating. And while I've always had a sensitive stomach for my whole life, I have no doubt in my mind whatsoever that the disordered eating really kicked it up a lot and caused a lot of the discomfort and the problems that manifested as these diagnosable conditions. 
And so even now that I'm many years into eating disorder recovery, and I haven't engaged in any disordered eating behaviors in years, I still occasionally have flare-ups of IBS or irritable bowel syndrome that manifest as things like constipation, bloating, and gas, as well as flare-ups of acid reflux and just general abdominal discomfort. And over the years, I've really discovered that my triggers for those flare-ups aren't related to food, right? Now that I'm not disordered about food anymore and I'm not cutting out foods unnecessarily, I can really see that there is no connection with food unless I happen to eat something super spicy, and that's pretty obvious. But instead of being about food, the triggers really are stress and changes in routine and travel, like you mentioned. Those are actually very common triggers for people. And I talked about this with Marcy Evans in episode 175, where we discussed disordered eating and digestion. And so I highly recommend checking that out for you or anyone who's curious about how disordered eating connects and intersects with digestive issues. You can get that episode at christyharrison.com slash 175 or wherever you're listening to this episode, just look up episode 175 and we'll link to that in the show notes for this episode too. So Carla, it sounds like you've had an experience that we talked about in that episode where the constipation you used to have in your eating disorder days is now mostly gone, which is awesome and very common. Like that's really what we see in the research and the lived experience of eating disorders, that eating disorders profoundly mess up your digestion, right? And stopping all disordered eating behaviors really helps improve digestive comfort and function. So in that episode, Marcy and I also talked about how for some people, not for everyone, but definitely a a certain small percentage of people, significant digestive issues can persist after the disordered eating is over. And that really sucks. And But things like yoga and gut-directed hypnotherapy can actually be really effective for those lingering digestive issues. And you don't have to cut out any foods to see a benefit. So that's really helpful for people who have are in really strong recovery from disordered eating and don't want to get triggered back down that rabbit hole by having to cut out different foods. They can try these other approaches And as Marcy and I discussed in that episode, yoga and gut-directed hypnotherapy have both been shown to be equally effective, if not more so, than the diet that typically gets prescribed to people with IBS, which can be incredibly triggering for anyone with a disordered eating history, and also which is not a fail-safe method. A lot of people still experience symptoms even when they're on that diet. But also, more to the point of your question, Carla, it sounds like you're having a lot of fear and anxiety about constipation and about other digestive issues as well. And that's interfering with your ability to feel free to travel and move about the world, you know, however you like and be spontaneous and do things out of your usual routine. And so I think that's really the operative concern here for you is that fear. And I think partly that fear for a lot of us comes from the wellness diet, which is my term for that sneaky modern manifestation of of diet culture that pretends to be all about wellness, right? It's like health and wellness. Oh, it's a lifestyle change. It's not a diet, but it's actually just another diet. And it's still part of the same oppressive system of diet culture. So the wellness diet is obsessed with poop. It's obsessed, like making sure you go to the bathroom, not being constipated. That is a total wellness diet obsession. We see this in message boards of people, you know, devoted to posting pictures of their poop and trying to figure out what's in it and posting stuff about how often they poop and talking about what supposed toxins the body is supposedly trying to get rid of in their poop, which of course is totally not true, right? Totally made up. Your body isn't riddled with toxins the way the detox proponents claim, and you're not seeing the toxins coming out in your poop the way they claim. So that's one piece of the wellness diet that I think even if you don't take it to that extreme of like take it like literally there are people who get these like sieves that they put over the toilet so they can catch their poop and then sift through it, hopefully wearing gloves to see like what's inside. And that that's extreme, right? That's a real extreme disordered behavior around bodily functions. But even if you don't take it to that extreme, there's still, I think, this obsession around, are you pooping enough? What's your poop like? Do you have good poops that is flying around in the wellness diet? That's very common. And so it sounds like, Carla, you maybe have absorbed some of that anxiety about like not pooping enough. The wellness diet is also obsessed with bloating, and it sounds like you've maybe absorbed some of that fear as well. 
you know, obsession with preventing bloating because the wellness diet really sees bloating as something that can be completely avoided by just cutting out particular foods. And again, that is total BS. That is not sound science. That's not founded on any real evidence. In reality, people have occasional bloating and gas, right? Bloating is really just in trapped intestinal gas. So bloating, gas, constipation, diarrhea, tummy aches, all of these things happen to all of us occasionally. And sure, they can be uncomfortable or sometimes painful. And I completely understand the desire to avoid them and manage them because I've been through that too. You know, I have a sensitive stomach. I definitely have probably a little more frequent than average experiences of gas and bloating and constipation and diarrhea and all that stuff. So it's not fun, right? It's not, it's not the most exciting thing in the world. But the reality is that our human bodies are that just that human. They all have these occasional aches and pains and misfires and ways that they don't function, quote unquote, optimally. And that's really normal. And it's a part of life. I talked about that with Alan Levinovitz on episode 94 of the podcast, which you can find at christyharrison.com slash 094. We're also searching episode 94 and wherever you're listening to this. We talk there about this false belief that you can control every aspect of your body and make sure that you never have another ache or pain or any normal human function again. And that's the kind of lie that the wellness diet loves to sell us, right? The wellness diet pretends that we can just avoid having any discomfort ever again if we eat the quote unquote right things and avoid the quote unquote wrong ones. And that just isn't true. And in fact, I think for many of us, it's quite the opposite, right? I know in my experience and for many other people I've spoken with, stressing yourself out about trying to avoid any and all digestive discomfort actually adds to the pain and makes things worse. And that makes total sense because one trigger for irritable bowel syndrome is stress, right? And stressing about the discomfort actually adds more stress and can make the pain worse. And so obviously, if you're listening to this and you're having constant pain or really frequent digestive symptoms, then definitely get help for them. That's the sort of line between normal daily aches and pains and what becomes a quote unquote syndrome, right? Irritable bowel syndrome can be a little blurry, but find help from a gastroenterologist or a dietitian who specializes in disordered eating. And before you do that, I'd really recommend listening to episode 175 for a nuanced discussion of how to go about getting getting help in a way that won't worsen your disordered eating, right? So finding a gastroenterologist or dietitian who's not going to put you on a diet to manage your condition, but actually use other evidence-based tools like yoga or like gut-directed hypnotherapy that I mentioned that have been shown to be effective for the digestive symptoms, but don't trigger the disordered eating. But for Carla, who asked the question, you know, it sounds like this really is an occasional thing for you. This is not something that's happening all the time. This is not, you know, the digestive discomfort itself, the constipation or bloating itself is not interfering with your daily life. It's actually the fear that's the problem. That's what's interfering with your life. That's what's holding you back. And so that's what you need to challenge, I would say. And, you know, show yourself that you can do it and that digestive discomfort isn't actually the total hindrance you're believing it to be. It's just you know, something that unfortunately comes up for a lot of us and makes us uncomfortable sometimes, but we go through it for the benefit of, you know, having a life that encompasses travel and spontaneity and fun and deviation from our routine, even though that deviation can sometimes cause some symptoms along the way. So I shared on episode 175 that when I travel, I definitely have a couple of days of digestive discomfort, but like I wouldn't trade the travel for anything. I love going to different places. I love going to see my family, going to speaking events and events where I can see other health at every size and intuitive eating providers in person, have community and connection. And and I wouldn't give that up for just staying at home in my normal routine where everything is kind of controllable just for the sake of having my digestion be, you know, quote unquote better because that's no way to live, right? Because then your life just becomes about managing your digestion at the expense of everything else. So I hope that was helpful. And if you want to submit your own question for a chance to have it answered on an upcoming episode, you can go to christyharrison.com slash questions. That's christyharrison.com slash questions. And then if you want to ask me any question you want and have me answer it for you within the following month, you can join my online course, Intuitive Eating Fundamentals. You can ask me all your questions and get individualized answers to them. Plus, you get a wealth of audio and written content that teach you the principles of intuitive eating in depth. Plus, 
this exclusive monthly Q&A podcast where I answer your questions and you can listen to hundreds of other answers I've given to past participants so that you can really work through all the little nuanced sticking points and things that come up for you as you work to put intuitive eating into practice in your life and reject diet culture. When you join, you also get access to our private community that's exclusively for course participants. And that is super cool because there you can get support from fellow people around the world who are going through this course and going through this anti-diet path with you alongside you. A participant with initials HM said, I love this course as it was the support I needed during an especially difficult and food sensitive time in my life due to an illness. When so many people have different views and opinions about what to eat for medical conditions, it was incredibly valuable to have a voice that I could trust. Another participant named Kelly said, I have read the book and have done other courses, but your course, Christy, has really helped. I'm now even seeing all the sneaky ways diet culture was around me and have been cutting it all out. It has been so liberating. I was hesitant to purchase the course thinking it was like other courses, but it's way better and worth the money. Your hard work on it shows. Thanks for all you do. I'm so grateful for you in this community today. If you're ready to break free from diet culture and reclaim the life it stole from you, you can learn more and sign up for the course at christyharrison.com slash course. That's christyharrison.com slash course. And now, without any further ado, let's go talk to Louise Metz. So tell me about your relationship with food growing up. So I grew up in North Carolina in an upper middle class family, and we always had adequate access to food. We ate a fairly typical Southern American diet and typically had family dinners together. And for the most part, I have very positive memories about meals with my family as a child. I think, you know, as a, a preschooler and elementary school age kid, I was a bit of a picky eater. So I was a, a little bit more particular than some kids and tended to prefer kind of more bland foods, you know, dairy and bread and, and fruit, which I think we see in, in some kids these days. I actually have uh, one of my children who, who eats that way. But I never experienced any pressure from my parents to eat certain foods or to clean my plate or to eat in any certain way. And I really give them a lot of credit for exposing me to different foods without any pressure that really allowed me over time to increase that food variety. So I, I give them a lot of credit for how they handled that. Yeah, that's great. Because I think parents get kind of scared when their kids are limited in that way, right? If they're not eating a variety of foods or they, they're eating, I mean, especially these days, I think if a kid's eating bread and dairy a lot, those are the the verboten foods du jour in diet culture. So it's pretty great that your parents had that sort of hands-off approach. Right. No, exactly. And, you know, we certainly see you know, young kids who are pressured to eat and then go on later to develop eating disorders based on that sort of pressure they experienced as a kid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pressure to eat or not eat certain things, definitely. Right, exactly. Um, and I think it's also important to note that I lived in a small body and, and didn't experience any external pressure about my body size or my body in relation to food and was really shielded from diet culture until I was a bit older. Yeah, that is so important, that thin privilege, right? That's, I think, helps people, some people who grow up in smaller bodies, develop and sustain a balanced relationship with food, a peaceful relationship with food longer than if you had been in a larger body and who knows how the family would react in that case. Right, definitely. And then, you know, when I went to high school, one thing I remember in early in high school is that I wrote a report about animal rights and decided to become vegetarian. So that went on for a few years and, and really it was a decision, you know, based on uh, what I felt was a moral decision at that time and didn't engage in any disordered behaviors then. But I also remember that that was the age that I was first exposed to diet culture. And I have this kind of vivid memory of being in the cafeteria eating with friends. And one of my friends eating with me said that we should all try to follow Oprah's recommendations, which at the time, apparently one of the things she said was to eat only dessert per day. So I remember that as kind of the first time I became aware that people were beginning to control uh, their food in order to control their body. Yeah, that's interesting. And that didn't sort of dovetail at all with your vegetarianism. It was just like a side side thing kind of a yeah kind of a side thing I think um you know probably stuck with me for a while and I mean I didn't develop any sort of disordered behaviors at, at that point but did a little bit later but that memory is very vivid it sort of um, really stuck with me yeah did that change how you ate at that time or did it sort of plant a seed for later on 
Yeah, I think it planted a seed. And um, throughout high school, I was a competitive athlete. So I played a lot of soccer. I was on a travel team and my high school team and spent you know a lot of my time doing that. And at the beginning of my senior year in high school, I had a serious knee injury and it took me completely out of soccer for the year. So I went from playing, you know, many hours of soccer a day to no exercise, which was very difficult on many levels for me. But um, as you might expect, my body changed a little bit after that and my body weight increased and I did develop some negative body image thoughts related to that. Yeah. And how did that affect you? What did you end up doing with that? Yeah, so I think on and off throughout that senior year, I did engage in some dieting behaviors. I tended to sometimes restrict during the day while at school and then would you know, eat a normal dinner and then multiple snacks in the evening because, of course, I was really hungry. And at the time, you know, felt like I was overeating or engaging in compulsive eating in the evenings. But of course, now looking back, I know that my body was just trying to make up for that restriction during the day. Mm, so common, right? That like mm-hmm. night eating that people label as binging or compulsive or just bad or emotional, oftentimes is just a, an effort by the body to compensate for that restriction earlier in the day. Right, exactly. Exactly. It's really that restriction that that drives that need to eat later. Our bodies are really quite amazing in that way. Exactly. Yeah, they're really trying to help us survive and and it gets so demonized. It's like we label that as something so wrong and bad because of diet culture, but actually it's a miraculous thing that bodies are able to do that. Definitely. And so did you start to identify then as a compulsive eater or... No, um, I think that, you know, those behaviors were fairly transient, didn't last for too long, probably on and off during that senior year of high school as I was kind of struggling with not having that identity as a soccer player, I think. But the behaviors kind of dissipated, you know, throughout that year um, and didn't really stick with me. But when I went off to college, shortly after getting to college, I started to develop some new physical symptoms. So I um, missed some periods, so developed irregular periods and also developed some hirsutism, which is extra hair growth on different parts of my body. And also with that experienced some weight gain. And so with those symptoms came an, also another time of an increase in negative body image thoughts around those symptoms. So what I remember about my relationship with food as a you know early college student was focusing on the low fat diet, which was really the the craze then. This is the, you know, mid to late nineties where, you know, all the kids had snack wells in their dorm rooms. And so I do remember trying to focus on a low fat diet based on those sort of negative body image thoughts that I was experiencing. Yeah. And how did that affect your relationship with food and your body? I think I struggled probably throughout that that year with those thoughts and engaging in, you know, some some dieting behaviors, but it really felt pretty normal to me, given that most of my peers around me were also kind of engaging in similar eating behaviors. So I, I think at that time, I thought it was pretty normal. But I struggled with this, the symptoms that I mentioned, and that continued you know, throughout my freshman year in college. And it wasn't till the end of that year that I sought out help from a doctor for my symptoms. So I ended up having a pretty extensive medical workup. I had a whole lot of lab testing and they really wanted to rule out all kinds of endocrine conditions, uh, pituitary problems, congenital endocrine problems. And most of that testing came out normal. And it turned out that I I was diagnosed with PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome. And at the time was put on medication, which was uh, birth control pills and a medicine called spironolactone, which blocks the effects of testosterone on the body. Right. That helps block like the hair growth and stuff that you're experiencing. Exactly. It blocks the hair growth. It can treat acne in, in people with PCOS who are experiencing acne as well. And what was that like for you, that, that experience of getting diagnosed and treated for PCOS? Um, well, I think at first it was, it was kind of a scary thing. Obviously, I wasn't in medicine yet, and so I didn't know a lot about that condition um, and was kind of worried at first about you know what was causing my symptoms. But once I started the medicine, I really began to feel better you know, over the following few months and was a little bit more comfortable with that diagnosis. But I think you know what's sort of interesting about it, you know looking back now, is that, uh, you know, like I mentioned, I had a really extensive testing for these symptoms. And what I see in my patients now who have PCOS is they often don't get that kind of workup. It's sort of an assumed 
if they present with irregular periods and, and hirsutism and they live in a larger body that they have PCOS. Yeah, that's interesting. And the the fact that you didn't live in a larger body made them take it more seriously, maybe, or made them want to rule out other conditions. Right, right. I think so. And then, and of course, then um, the treatment, I think, or the way the treatment was approached for me is different than what I hear from my patients and others who have PCOS who live in larger bodies. So, um, as you probably know, often the first thing that someone with PCOS is told if they live in a larger body is to lose weight, and that's often considered the primary treatment for their condition. And and that was not something that I was ever told as part of my treatment. It's so wild, right? That disconnect between what gets recommended for someone in a larger body and what gets recommended for someone in a smaller body. The evidence-based medicine that people in smaller bodies get and that I know I got too when I was being, I also was misdiagnosed actually as having PCOS and Mm -hmm. it ended up being some other stuff, but it, it was, you know, they did the full workup for me too. I remember going into MRI machines and having scans for pituitary abnormalities and, you know, all different kinds of blood tests and stuff and never being told to lose weight certainly and it's it's just mind-boggling how dismissed people in larger bodies are with the same condition right definitely yeah you take two two different people with the exact same symptoms and their you know the workup and the treatment can be completely different just based on body size which really makes no sense and and is definitely not evidence-based no not at all when did you start to want to become a physician? Was that part of the genesis of that, is, was getting your own diagnosis? or That came a little bit later in college. So I studied women's studies in biology in college, and I wasn't sure for the first few years what I wanted to do. And then I did some social justice work. I was participating in organizations on campus that address sexual violence against women, for instance, and had you know, an interest in social justice work. And then I took a couple classes in the women's studies department towards the end of college. And uh, one was a class on the history of women's health research and the political efforts that occurred in the, I think it was the late, mid to late 90s, to increase representation of women in research studies. And it was taught by a physician who was really active in this political work. And so that was a very inspiring class for me. And at the same time, I took a class on the history of women in science and medicine. And it focused both on the history of women as providers and women as patients. And so it was really those two classes that inspired me to go into medicine and really to want to approach medicine from a feminist perspective and really with an awareness of some of the problems with the standard you know, paradigms in medicine. Uh, and really wanted to, you know, go into healthcare to try to help change things. Oh, that's amazing. That's I feel like it is too rare to see physicians with a real understanding of social justice and at the root, you know. Mm-hmm. That's that's very cool. Yeah. So it was more motivated, it sounds like, by this the the social justice piece and the the feminist piece, but not really an awareness yet of like weight stigma or body based bias. Exactly. No, definitely not. I really had no awareness at that time at all about weight stigma. It wasn't something that had come up for me or in my studies. I feel like it's just recently that it started to be talked about in the scientific research and, you know, more people in in med school or pre-med or whatever hearing about it now than ever before. But yeah, it, it never was a thing. Right. Yeah. And I, you know, went on to to med school from there. And, you know, I do remember my first exposure to eating disorders during med school. And it was my third year. And I had one patient, a young woman with anorexia while I was on the psychiatric inpatient service. And and that really stuck with me, just working with that patient and beginning to learn about eating disorders. And at that time, it wasn't something that was included in our training or our curriculum in med school at all. And I had you know some friends and I who were interested in this area, and we created a workshop to try to learn more about eating disorders. And also, as you may know, we don't learn much about nutrition as med students. So there was very little training at all on nutrition either. Yeah, it's it's wild how little information 
is, you know, I've heard from a lot of physicians the same thing, that there's very little on nutrition, if anything. Maybe it's a class or maybe it's part of one semester or something like that, but it's not not really taught in a lot of medical schools. And then how much physicians are asked to provide nutrition information, especially now, and how much certain physicians do do that in the media and write whole books and have whole programs that they're giving out this nutrition information without actually the background. It just sort of makes me laugh slash makes me cry. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yes. We are suddenly considered experts and we really are not. And I think that my training was maybe one you know, two hour online module during medical school. And then so going into working with eating disorders too, you probably had to give yourself a crash course in just how nutrition worked or especially with a client with anorexia, like nutritional rehabilitation. Right. Definitely. Definitely. I've really had to yeah, seek out the, the training along the way for sure. And do you feel like your interest in eating disorders was also kind of grounded in feminist thought? Like, was that part of your, your desire to go into that field or that specialization? Yeah, I do. I think it was. Later on, towards the end of med school, I took a, a women's health elective up in New York. And that also was a, a time that really you know, influenced um, you know, the areas that I was interested in. But I worked with a doctor who, who was an internist who did women's health research and eating disorders came up during my time with her. And you know, she also talked a lot about different ways to approach medicine and was interested in looking at complexity theory and how it interacted with medicine rather than the typical kind of uh, linear or reductionist models of medicine where we kind of break things down in different categories and different systems. And so she really, you know, looked at looked at things in a different way. So, you know, I think that also, you know, while I was working with her, eating disorder started to come up. So I gained some more interest there. And I think it was, you know, later on, once I did my residency and then ended up moving back to North Carolina, that I started doing a little bit more work in eating disorders. That's interesting. Tell me more about complexity theory. I'm just so curious what that is. So complexity theory also kind of fits in with chaos theory. And so the idea is that there that you have systems that interact. And so in medicine, it would be body systems interacting with each other and health and body systems interacting with the environment. And then chaos theory is, is when you think about, you know, one thing in, in health in your body that could then lead to change in other parts of your body or your health. And so really the standard in Western medicine is really to kind of, again, break things down by organ system. So for instance, in internal medicine, we think of our patients in as problem lists. So we list out all these different problems or we list out uh, different organ systems and we really separate things out and we don't look at how things interact. And so I think, you know, complexity theory was also this sort of feminist way of, of looking at medicine and a more holistic way of looking at um, how things interact. And I think it also kind of, you know, fits in with a Hayes approach and in, in thinking about social determinants of health and, and how our society and our environment affects our health. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. I mean, I think that that the sort of breaking medicine down into individual systems, I think that's part of why a lot of people, and I know I had this experience myself too, and I see it a lot in, in clients of mine, sort of shy away from Western medicine at a certain point, especially when they have issues that aren't being diagnosed or easily doctors can't easily put their fingers on. It's like the draw or the desire is towards like more alternative sources of medicine that do provide that kind of holistic approach or a sense that they're going to give you a holistic approach. Oftentimes it's really not. Oftentimes it's like, just cut out these 15 foods or whatever. These like 38 foods. Right, um, right. It's all about the physical. It's not about like mental and social and emotional, but, but there's a sort of promise. And I mean, certainly certain naturopathic and alternative practitioners don't do that and are, are much more truly holistic. But that desire for like holism, I think, can drive some people away from Western medicine. And so it's really cool to hear you say that there is actually a school of thought in Western medicine and that, you know, it sounds like it's an approach that you practice too of looking at the whole person and the complexities of how systems interact without the woo woo stuff, maybe that's right. <laughs> thrown in. <laughs> to no, definitely. <laughs> definitely. I totally agree. And, you know, I think PCOS is a good example of that too. And I think in standard, Western medicine, where we want to simplify things, there's this 
thought that, okay, it must be larger body size or weight gain that then leads to these changes. So insulin resistance, and then it leads to PCOS. And then that can lead to other complications like diabetes. So they want to kind of separate it out in this linear fashion when really PCOS is a genetic condition. And then there are environmental factors that are at play. And that, you know, someone with PCOS in a larger body experiences weight stigma and that weight stigma is going to affect their health. And it's really these all these moving parts and that we really need to kind of look at rather than trying to simplify it and just blame it on body size or weight gain. Right. And saying, yeah, that this is this linear thing. Weight gain causes X, Y and Z or whatever, which is such a diet culture way of seeing things and so entrenched in Western medicine, too. Even just the the suggestion that we could be looking at other mediators like weight stigma and weight cycling, I think, is so foreign to a lot of medicine. It's thankfully starting to creep in. But the the idea that, you know, maybe it's not weight itself that's the problem, I think, is is still anathema to many, many physicians. Yes, unfortunately, it, it really is. With the, the weight bias that is so ingrained, it's hard for most physicians to to take a look at that. Well, how did you start to, I mean, you know, I'm curious kind of how your own education shaped your views on weight, maybe the sort of more mainstream way, but then how you started to break out of that and see things differently. Yeah. So, you know, I was thinking about kind of how I was trained, you know, in residency, I was out in San Francisco for my residency and I worked primarily at the inner city hospital. So San Francisco General Hospital and had my continuity clinic there. And And I was thinking about whether I learned anything about weight and health and dieting. And I don't remember it really being a part of my training at all. And I think that there, the reason for that is that we were taking care of, you know, very marginalized, underserved patients and that we were really having to focus on whether our patients had housing and and focus on their food security and whether they could pay for the meds that they're on and help them with their substance abuse. And so we were really focused on these more urgent needs. And so I I feel like talking about body size and dieting didn't really come up. So I I feel like it never really sank in to me in the beginning of my training that I needed to be focusing on weight and health. So I think that may be part of what influenced me. And so I think, you know, later on, I eventually, after you know, living in San Francisco and then New York, I eventually uh, moved back to North Carolina, which is where I grew up. And I started working at a university-based primary care clinic. And so this was more of an insured population, so very different than what I had worked with in San Francisco and New York. And it was at that time that I, the sort of the diet culture started to creep in and the standard kind of weight weight management paradigms just crept right, right into the work that I did. And I, and I think that just must have been just ingrained from the parts that I had learned along the way in training and then in society. Yep, it just creeps in for all of us, I think. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, definitely. So I think actually recently looked back at some of my notes when I, you know, it's been about 10 years I've been back here and I looked back at the notes for some of my patients who I've been seeing for over 10 years. It was really interesting to look at the evolution of my thinking and how I was taking care of, of patients and also pretty horrifying for me to look at some of my earlier notes and, you know, using body size as a, as a disease and a diagnosis and, and talking about weight, weight management. But that definitely was something I was, I was doing then. But also alongside that, I was taking care of patients with eating disorders. So there was definitely a, a really a big contrast in, in what I was doing. Yeah, I think that's so true for so many of us. I know I had my own experience of fence straddling and not even realizing it was fence straddling, you know, having one foot in the eating disorders world and one foot in the quote unquote weight management world and thinking that it was just different populations that I was serving. So this type of person is looking for weight management. This type of person needs help for an eating disorder and never the twain shall meet. <laughs> and like, right. actually, you know, it wasn't until a few years in that I was like going to conferences and learning, meeting with people and working with a supervisor who was very rooted in health at every size and recognized, oh, right, you can't actually do both. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I think I had, you know, one protocol with my nursing staff for my patients with eating disorders and sort of a different one for other patients. So I would have the nurses either not weigh my patients with eating disorders or to do blind weights if I needed them. And then everybody else got weighed. And so I would, you know, go in one room and work on medical management of a patient's eating disorder and really try to avoid talking about 
body size in that room and then, you know, would go into the next room and and talk about diets. And at that time, I I think I thought I was practicing in a sort of a non-diet way because I was using terms like, quote, lifestyle changes or, quote, unquote, portion control. And, um, of course, we know those are just different phrases for, for diet culture. But certainly looking back, I mean, the contrast was pretty stark in the work that I was doing. Yeah, I think it's it's so helpful to look back in that way, just to see how far you've come. And I've done that myself, too, looking back at some earlier notes and being like, oh, wow, I really have come such a long way. For, I would do this totally differently now, which I think speaks to how much medicine and other forms of healthcare are more of an art than a science, you know, like that there is, there is a scientific evidence base, you know, it's like we think there's a scientific evidence base for weight loss, or we're told that and we're shown evidence that supposedly supports that that gets filtered through the framework of like, oh, yeah, it's the cause of, you know, quote, unquote, obesity is the cause of disease or whatever. And so we, we think that we're doing evidence based work when we're trying to help people lose weight, but actually, it's not, you know, actually, that evidence doesn't really show what we think it shows. And so, you know, it kind of, as we evolve or start to learn more about weight stigma, I think it, it starts to become clear that what we thought was the evidence base before really isn't and and that the same physician or the same dietitian or the same therapist or any healthcare practitioner if you see them 5 years apart or whatever some you know one time for a particular condition and then you know the same physician 5 years down the line or 10 years down the line it might be a completely different diagnosis or set of recommendations mhm definitely definitely yes that that is sort of this uh, the assumption that was stuck in medicine about body size and health. And really, you're right, it's it's not based on on evidence. Did anyone ever, like, did any of your clients or patients that you worked with for, quote unquote, lifestyle change or weight management have any sort of pushback or reaction to it that, that started to draw your awareness to that? Or how did you start to realize that that wasn't something you wanted to do? Yeah, that's a good question. No, I don't I don't think any any patients ever, you know, brought anything up because again, I think for most patients and most people, you know, living in this society, that seems normal. And, you know, they, they come to the doctor asking for for diet recommendations and ways to lose weight. And that's often, you know, a presenting question for most patients. So I didn't have any pushback then. But, you know, I think that in working with patients with eating disorders, I started to like over time start to recognize that the two things I was doing didn't didn't really fit that you know how could I go in in one room and talk to a patient with an eating disorder and try to avoid talking about body size and and help them on in, intuitive eating behaviors and then be in the other room doing something different and so that started to just I started to realize that that it just wasn't fitting and really I I give credit to all of my eating disorder colleagues in the area who opened my eyes to a health at every size approach. So actually, the the person who initially started referring patients to me to do this eating disorders work is Anna Lutz, who is a Hayes dietitian and eating disorder specialist in Raleigh. And she happens to be my sister. (laughs) And so she was the one who first introduced the idea of health at every size to me. And this was around the time I was deciding to open my own practice. So, you know, she and other providers in the eating disorder community started to talk with me about a health at every size approach. And it was almost like you know, just the light bulbs went off, like suddenly everything made sense and that I could, you know, practice the same type of care for all of my patients. Wow, that's amazing. And it's so rare, I think, too, for physicians to have that kind of awakening. I think it's lucky that you had such a great eating disorder community that you were in touch with and, and also having a sister in it maybe made made that like access to it sort of deeper. Definitely, definitely. And, you know, I was at the time I learned about a weight inclusive approach, I was wanting to leave the bigger system where I was working because I really felt like it was hard for me to provide the type of care that I wanted to for my patients with all the constraints of a big big system. So having to see patients in a 15-minute slot was, was very difficult. And especially for a patient with an eating disorder or someone with complex medical problems, I really felt like the system isn't, you know, was not conducive to providing adequate and high quality care where we could really, you know, talk to our patients and, and really provide holistic care. And so I was looking to create sort of a different model. And so as I was, you know, working on creating my own practice, learning about weight inclusive care really kind of fit in with 
with what I was hoping to do. And yeah, I think probably being outside of a system like that makes it easier, right? Because I've heard tales of physicians who are required to get weights and nurses and stuff too, who are, you know, required to take a, someone's weight if they are in a large medical system, required to ask them about what they're doing to lose weight or to talk to them about how to lose weight. Like it's, it can be so, it can box you in so much to a certain kind of way of relating to people around food and their bodies. Definitely. Yes. And, you know, at the sort of the end of my time at the other practice, I was trying my best to sort of do, do my own thing and, and try to work, you know, within the system. And it is it is really difficult. So, you know, creating my own practice was uh, really helped to just create a different model. And so, you know, at, at our practice, we, you know, for the most part, don't weigh our patients unless there's a medical indication and we don't put any weights into the chart. And one thing I will say about that is we hear a lot from providers that, like you said, that they have to put the number in or have to put the number in to get reimbursed by insurance. And I will say that we get reimbursed for all of our patient visits and we don't put weights in on any patients. And so it may be a misconception that that's, that's the case. That's amazing. I did that. Thank you for sharing that because I think that's really counter to what we hear. Is there a way that you code things to to make that happen? Is there a way that like something that you put in the weight field on the chart to make it work? So we actually don't put anything in the weight field. And we also, we have been instructed by insurance companies to use ICD-10 codes for body size. And we don't do that either. And our, our claims just, just go through. And it's not something that the insurance needs. I will say there are quality programs with certain insurance companies. And I, and I know that that happens in bigger systems too. They may be hospital-based quality programs where they monitor weights in the charts. And they use those weights to measure uh, weight as a quality measure. And then some providers and systems then might receive uh, bonuses or productivity pay based on that. And that's something that we have been asked to do by insurance companies. And we have just let them know that we will not participate in that particular quality measure. Yeah. So it's almost, it's just incentivizing people to do it. It's incentivizing healthcare systems to do it, but it's not a requirement. It's just a way to basically increase profits, it sounds like. Right, exactly. Oof, that is interesting because it, it puts, you know, a whole new light on this idea of like, well, we're required to ask. It's like, actually, who's requiring it? It's it's the hospital system maybe that wants to make more money. And I get it to a certain extent, but also like at what cost, right? It's at a cost to your patient's welfare, really. Right, exactly. And I think it's always important to really to question these things that we're told we're required to do. You know, let's let's ask, well, why is that? And do we really have to do this? And what what ways do we have around it? Yeah. And how cool that you've been able to get around it, too, because I've heard people say, and I've done this myself, just put refused in my chart, just put instead right. of where the weight goes, just put refused. And that seems to be like the magic keyword <laughs> that that works for some of these hospital systems. But it's amazing that you can also get by without any weight in the charts whatsoever. Right. Definitely. And no, I do think that's good advice in general for for patients to advocate for themselves is, is just to state that, you know, just please state refused and put that in my chart. I, I certainly agree with that strategy. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. That word just seems to carry some weight to it. And I'm curious, you know, when you said like there are a few things that are medically necessary reasons to weigh someone, what would you say those are? Like, what are the reasons you might want to weigh a person? So one reason would be a, a person. So some individuals with eating disorders. So if they are weight suppressed and they're actively restoring weight, we might check their weight. Or if they have been acutely losing weight in relation to their eating disorder, there are times when we might check their weight. And in that, those situations, we would weigh those individuals blindly. So we have a, a special scale that has a screen that can be pulled away from the patient and it has a high weight capacity and we bring it into the exam room. So we would never do that in any sort of public area. So that in our office is the is the main reason we might weigh an individual. The only other real medical reasons would be uh, prescribing a medication that is weight-based. And that really in adults comes up very rarely. And, and mostly that pertains to things like anesthesia and chemotherapy. So in primary care, it comes up uh, pretty rarely. That might come up for children, but not for adults. And then I think the only other 
you know, clear indication to consider doing weights would be for growth and development in children, that that is something that pediatricians would do. But in our office, we see predominantly adults. We do see some adolescents. But for the most part, most of our patients do not need their weight taken. That's so, so helpful to know. And I mean, I definitely think the the growth and development piece with children is tricky, right? Because there's no way to sort of make sure that a kid is growing the way they need to be growing or that there's not some kind of underlying medical condition that might be stopping their growth or causing weight loss or whatever it is. So I get the need for that. But I think there's probably a way for, you know, just like you said, having a special scale that you can pull the screen out of the person's view so that they're not having to stare the weight number in the face. Like there's easy, you yes. know, so relatively easy switches people can or practices can make to make sure that weight doesn't have to be in someone's face. Definitely, definitely. And definitely for children and, and adolescents, I think that's really important that there really should not be a focus in the pediatrician's office on that number either. Oh, I know. And yet so often it is, right? And not only is there the weight number right there in front of them, but it's there's also a BMI chart next to it on the wall. Like, right. this is the danger zone or whatever. It's like, ugh, what are we doing? Right. No, definitely. That's certainly a population that that I really worry about. Um, and we know that, you know, being told to diet, and especially in that age group, really sets uh, kids up for eating disorders later in life. Yeah. Well, and as we're recording this, too, the Weight Watchers Curbo thing has just rolled out. The yes. Weight Watchers rolled out their app for kids. And then we've had such a big, strong backlash in the eating disorders and Hayes community, which has been so great to see. And, you know, I've been a part of it, writing some op-eds for the New York Times. And we've had a lot of other people writing for different outlets and kind of getting a lot of national attention for this, just pushing back on the idea that kids should ever be put on a diet and bringing out the evidence that it is actually really harmful for children to focus on weight and be told to lose weight. Definitely. It's, it's extremely harmful, but really good to hear that um, there's a lot of pushback and I hope that makes a difference. I hope so too. I mean, if, if it can make a difference for even just a few kids and families, then I'll feel like it was worth it. But of course, there's millions and millions of people who are affected by this and definitely disproportionately affects the largest bodied kids the most. So mm -hmm. who are already marginalized and, and dealing with weight stigma and other forms of stigma all over the place. So they, you know, they need our help for sure. Definitely. They need everybody's help, <laughs> like everybody listening to this. I think they do. Mm -hmm. Curious too, you know, in terms of taking weight, like the one other reason that I hear people say they need to weigh their patients is for pregnancy, monitoring pregnancy. What are your thoughts on that? Are there ways of tracking, uh, you know, fetuses growth and development without uh, weighing the mother or the, the parent? Yeah, I think that's a good question. And, and I think that that probably is a, an appropriate indication. And I just wonder whether it could be approached in a different way. I do think that it, it is helpful from a medical standpoint to periodically check weights during pregnancy, maybe not as often as they are done, but I do think mm -hmm. that is important. Um, but I, I worry that there is just way too much focus um, on that number um, for, for women who are pregnant. Um, and so I wonder whether doing blind weights or just mm -hmm. taking less emphasis on that number would, would really be more beneficial um, because it could be so anxiety provoking for people who are pregnant to to go through that and, and then to experience shame if their weight has gone up too high um, or worry too much if it hasn't increased enough. Um, and I'm not exactly sure how, you know, how evidence-based some of those recommendations are. Right. Yeah, that is so true. It's, it seems like a lot of it comes out of fat phobia, really, and this normative idea of what someone's weight should be. So if someone's already in a larger body, the recommendations are like much lower amount of weight gain, or even sometimes I've heard people say that they're recommended to lose weight in pregnancy, which is just mind boggling. It's horrifying. Yeah. yeah. Like, how is that possibly helpful or beneficial to anyone? It's, it's scary. It is scary and it's, and it's dangerous. And we know that each individual's body is different, that some people are going to gain more weight in the beginning of pregnancy. Some might gain it later. And we're not going to each follow this same exact, you know, curve or path of, of weight gain that is expected or that we see in the textbooks. Right. And yeah, what is that based on even too is probably some sample, you know, a, a population level study or two or however many done, you know, probably a long time ago, really. Right. 
And and we're basing these sort of norms and ideas now on that instead of on what does your individual body want to do and how does how is your individual body reacting to pregnancy? It's fascinating to think about the evidence base for different things and how sort of shoddy it is, you know, how the how there's really not good evidence in favor of things like weight ranges for pregnancy or weight loss in general. It's it's just not there. And yet that's what everybody is taught in the healthcare professions, you know. Right. No, definitely. And I think it's just, you know, again, it's sort of this underlying assumption that I think all healthcare providers have. They assume that this evidence exists, that there is evidence that weight you know, equates to health. And it really is just that. It's really an assumption. It really is rooted in the weight bias of healthcare providers. And the evidence just isn't there. And the evidence actually is there to the contrary. Um, You know, that we have pretty good evidence about, you know, the effects of weight stigma and the negative effects of weight cycling. And the fact that the BMI scale does not uh, equate to health, uh, if we look at those numbers. I know it's it's wild what the evidence truly says. And I'm curious too, like how your experience of medical school and training kind of dealt with the evidence or lack thereof for weight loss. Like, did you get any sense of did you did you have to read studies that like delved into the association between weight and certain health outcomes? Were you like instructed on how to read research studies and and be able to kind of critically analyze that research or was it sort of taken as like a given like oh we know that quote unquote obesity is bad for health therefore x y and z i think it really was just taken as a given or as an assumption so i don't remember any you know classes or any parts of my training where we actually read through the literature at all and so i think it was really just this this baseline assumption that weight equates to health. And um, it was never challenged. It was just sort of assumed that that was the case. Um, I definitely along the way learned learned how to you know, critically read studies, but I never had any, any focus on this particular topic. It was all really just assumed all along the way. Wow. I remember too, like in getting my master's of public health, having to take a research methods class and learning how to critically analyze studies, but at the same time was also becoming a dietitian, getting all the coursework done to get my RD and taking classes that were making all these assumptions based on body size and talking about the quote unquote obesity epidemic and all this stuff. And just never, it never connected. You know, I was like excited. I loved research methods. I loved like analyzing studies and I would analyze the studies that our professor gave us to do, but I would never apply that same thinking to the other studies in my other classes and start poking holes in them the way that I have now started to do, you know. Right. That is really interesting. And there's just so much focus on evidence-based medicine, you know, and it has been all along in my training, particularly in internal medicine, which is my field. Um, we're so focused on it. And then on the other hand, we are providing this type of care, this weight management care that is completely not based on evidence. And for instance, we you know we know, as you know, that dieting is completely ineffective and that in up to 98% of individuals who lose weight will regain the weight and two-thirds of those will typically regain more. And really, there aren't any other treatments that we would prescribe in our field where we would you know want to prescribe a treatment that would fail in such a high percentage of cases. So it's just sort of baffling, you know, that we're so focused on on the evidence, but we just have a blind spot in this area. Yeah, there's just this one place that it's like, oh, evidence-based, evidence-based, but don't look over there. Like, <laughs> right. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. <laughs> like, <laughs> right, exactly. It's yeah, it's really wild. So I'm so glad that you have made this transition and and started to become a voice for physicians practicing in this other way, because it's just, there's just too few of you out there. I mean, people will ask me, like, I'm looking for a doctor who practices health at every size. Can you recommend someone for me in my city? And I'm like, probably not in your city, probably like <laughs> a few in the country and maybe one in Mexico, you know? Like, <laughs> right, right. Well, I'm actively trying to recruit more of us. So hopefully this is going to change over time. Oh, I really hope so. I'm really hopeful that we can continue to, to educate physicians and all, all other healthcare providers uh, in this field, for sure. Yeah, what's been your experience of that, of helping educate other physicians or medical students? 
You know, it's it's challenging. The ingrained weight bias really limits the ability of providers to see things in a different way. And I um, I do get pretty stuck sometimes talking to other providers um, uh, because of these assumptions. And even when I kind of bring out the literature and show them the studies, it's almost like there's like, you know, again, this sort of mental block. But what I think I'm finding the most helpful over time is, is really trying to focus on the lived experience of the patient and focus on, you know, what what is compassionate care and are we really providing compassionate care with this weight management approach? And so I wonder whether, you know, talking more about that and hearing from, you know, patients and individuals who have experienced, you know, terrible you know, weight stigma in the healthcare setting will eventually help some providers see things in a different way. And I, I think that part is part of what's helped the providers in my practice see things in a different way is, is really just like listening to patients and their experiences. It's so important. And yeah, I think it probably is is effective too because people don't become doctors to hurt people. Like they want to help. They go, you know, it's it's a helping profession. And I think all of us in helping professions are drawn in because we want to do good. And so learning that maybe some of our work has been doing harm is confronting, but also I think really helpful for paving the way for a change. Yeah, I, I think so. And I, at the Academy of Eating Disorders Conference this past spring, there's something that I heard that really stuck with me. I was listening to a talk and uh, Rachel Milner, who you may know, was talking about uh, working with her clients on preparing them for the trauma of going to the doctor. And that really has stuck with me, you know, just to think that they're, you know, that people have to go to treatment to prepare themselves to come in to the place where they're supposed to be partnering with healthcare providers in pursuing, you know, their health and their wellness I mean, it's just horrifying, you know, and there's clearly a serious problem with our system if, if that is the case. And I think it really is. You know, there really is trauma in the medical system. You know, patients who are marginalized really can experience trauma when they go in to see the doctor due to the bias and, and stigma that exists. Oh, so true. And it's heartbreaking to think that. I mean, it really is. I think of it as trauma going to the doctor, too, for so many people. But to be a provider and hearing that, that's got to be just heartbreaking. It really is. Yeah. And I'm curious for the physicians listening, because I know we have many, I mean, I don't know how many, but definitely have talked to a number of listeners who are doctors or medical students and, you know, Hayes MDs to be. What would you say is, is a helpful approach in starting to shift your practice or prepare for going into practice in a truly weight-inclusive way? Well, I think it is important to, you know, acknowledge that, you know, our health healthcare system has caused and continues to cause harm with its weight normative approach. And I think the, the evidence really points to that. And and really to talk with them about the fact that, you know, weight inclusive care is really the only ethical and evidence based way to practice medicine. And I think we need to start questioning and, and challenging some of the assumptions that that we have that stick with us from training. And again, try to try to just think about the lived experience, you know, sit down with patients and and talk to them about what they've experienced and really kind of name that the weight stigma and, and talk to them about it. And I think if you really kind of bring it down to that patient's lived experience, I think it becomes very clear that weight inclusive care is really the most compassionate, again, evidence based and, and ethical way to practice medicine. And what would you say to, you know, I've heard, I've done some debates with a physician who treats the O word, right? And considered, you know, is considered an O word expert, which is just a silly term. But <laughs> I think his response and some of the, the audience responses in these debates has been, if you're a provider and you're saying, well, I don't offer weight loss services, that is not part of my practice, I'm not going to work with you to lose weight, I'm, I approach things from a health at every size perspective, that that is somehow not patient-centered care, that like having the, that boundary is not giving the person what they want or asking for it when so many patients do ask for weight loss is somehow like unethical or not patient-centered. What would you say to that? 
Yeah, that's that's a good question. I've had I've gotten that question before uh, from providers, including those who work in in my practice, and I think it's a a good question. But I but I think that the way I approach that is that it's really our duty to do no harm. You know, to to not harm our patients, and and it's our duty to to listen to them and really understand where they're coming from and give them the space to talk about their experiences and their desire to lose weight. But we we really know that it's very clear that recommending dieting is harmful, that we know that, you know, weight cycling, you know, body weight going up and down increases risk of diabetes and hypertension and other health conditions. And so that is a treatment that causes harm. And so therefore, um, I I don't think that that's an appropriate, you know, patient centered type of care. If we know it's a treatment that's going to hurt someone, just like we wouldn't prescribe a medicine that we know, in most cases is going to harm someone. But I think that if we sit and, and listen to our patients and really, again, leave space for what they're experiencing, then that, then that is a you know, compassionate patient-centered care. Right. And I think that's so important what you said about giving space for them to talk about why they want to lose weight and have them be listened to and honored in that desire to lose weight, because that's not something in the health at every size community that we pathologize. Like we get it. I get it. You know, that people, why you would want to lose weight in this culture. Of course you would. Right. And the evidence is not there for weight loss being effective, sustainable, or um, beneficial. And in fact, it's harmful. So like as providers, we really can't ethically prescribe it. We can't ethically give that as a line of treatment just in the same way that we can't ethically, like you said, prescribe medications that maybe the FDA has removed from the market or whatever because they were found to be harmful. You know, like there's, and I feel like medicine is always evolving in that sense, right? There's always things that, you know, we thought 20 years ago XYZ was beneficial and actually now we've shown that it's really the complete opposite and that 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 was harmful to people. And medicine sort of allowed to evolve in all these other arenas and, you know, certainly is problematic and upsetting when we realize that we've been doing treatments that were actually harmful or didn't have the intended effect or whatever. But but somehow this one area with weight loss, I feel like there's this resistance to evolve in the same way. Yeah, there really is. There's, I think, yeah, resistance among providers in the, in the healthcare system and resistance among patients too, because, you know, again, they're hearing this message everywhere. And so it is important to really you know, give those patients the the time and the space and a non-judgmental, you know, space to really be able to talk about it. And, you know, especially for me as someone who has been privileged and doesn't know what it's like to experience that kind of stigma, it's really important for us to to allow our patients to to talk about it and to very slowly over time start to introduce you know this new approach which can be alarming to patients at first too because it's just so different than what they hear anywhere else. Yeah, how do you feel like people react when you first broach that with them? Some patients are really surprised or shocked and it can be hard to understand, you know, when they hear a different message anywhere else they would go. So any other doctor's office or of course, just out there in society or from their friends, um, it can be really hard for them to hear. So I typically kind of introduce the ideas carefully and slowly and try to share some of the evidence with them. We also have a, a handout we give to our patients that summarizes some of that evidence in ways that people can understand. And just it's a pro, it's a progression. We talk about it at every visit. And I also, of course, refer to the many you know amazing Hayes practitioners in my area, dietitians, therapists, and and get a lot of help with you know unlearning uh, what what people believe to be true about weight and health. Yeah, it does take so much unlearning, right? And especially, I think for me and other dietitians and therapists specializing in this area, I think oftentimes we have it easier than maybe a physician, like especially an internal medicine physician, because people are coming to you for all kinds of reasons, right? They're they're coming to you for sort of general things. Whereas when someone seeks me out or a lot, you know, a lot of my Hayes colleagues, it's like they know that they have a problem with food and their body image, or you know, they they're they're sort of aware of what they need, even if they don't, even if they aren't totally ready to give up 
the pursuit of weight loss, they at least are sort of aware enough to that's why they're coming to us, you know, they see our marketing and they resonate with it in some way, because they know that dieting and diet culture isn't working for them. So like, I think, especially as I've gotten, you know, more and more clear as my career has gone on, and what I offer and what I don't offer, I'm not having to deal with as much education of people from square one. I have a little bit with my recent New York Times articles and some of the debates I've done and stuff where it is much more like people are not ready. They're not where I'm at. And so having to do a lot of that square one education. But for you, it seems like probably you get a lot of people who are coming in just without any sort of awareness or education around haze and might be like, oh my God, what is this? You know? Yeah, no, definitely. And and really, sometimes they come in, you know, asking for different treatments that might help them lose weight. So yeah, that is sort of a different, different approach or different population, maybe that, that I would see. But I also, you know, we also see a lot of patients who are just so pleasantly surprised when they come in and they're not weighed. Sometimes we'll have patients, you know, walk down the hall after their visit and just, you know, thank us for um, not having to have that di- very difficult experience of being weighed in the doctor's office. And so we really get a lot of positive feedback about it. That's so cool. That's, yeah, I think it is really something that people dread without even knowing it necessarily, that they go to the doctor and they're going to have to have this conversation. I mean, that's why we see in the literature that people in larger bodies often will put off going to the doctor because of that weight stigmatizing interaction of having to be weighed and other weight stigmatizing interactions, like having to wear a paper gown that isn't able to cover your body or have a blood pressure cuff that doesn't fit you or all of those different things too. So it's like such a minefield to go to the doctor's office for people in larger bodies. And I get why they're just like, yeah, let me not, let me wait until something is really serious before I go. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I very clear that weight stigma prevents people from coming in just for their basic, you know, preventive healthcare. That's another way that weight management, weight-centric paradigm is is harmful. Right, because then people, when people do end up coming to the doctor, it's with diseases further along. They've usually progressed further. And oftentimes, too, then they're told like, oh, well, you should lose weight and that'll go away. And then that delays their getting the proper care even more to the point where sometimes people will end up with really advanced disease states that then take a lot more treatment, a lot more financial investment and all of that stuff to to be able to recover from when you know if they had just gotten the proper treatment to begin with and not been scared to go to the doctor because they knew they were going to get fat shamed uh, how many lives could we save how much money and time and well-being could we save for people if we just did not have a stigmatizing medical system in the first place Oh, definitely. Definitely. It's, it's a, it's a big problem. And, you know, weight inclusive care is, is not a, you know, a difficult thing to provide, you know, it's not rocket science. Again, it's <laughs> really just comes down to being compassionate and inclusive and affirming of all bodies. And it's something that really, we should all be doing, of course. Yeah. And I think it's, it's true. It's not rocket science, because especially with medicine for physicians, where you do so much, so many different things, there's so many different treatments for any condition a person could have, just giving the treatment that you know how to deliver, and taking weight loss out of the equation seems like a really easy first step, right? Like, just doing like Reagan Chastain often says, like, what would you prescribe to a thin person with this condition? Yes, yes. No, I love I love that recommendation by by Reagan. And I tell my patients that, you know, when they're going out to see other providers, you know, to use to use that when they're talking to other folks. And you're right, if you really think about it, it really should take take something off the physicians, you you eliminate that you don't have to talk about weight. And let's really get down to the nitty gritty and try to help this person with their health problem. And, you know, actually find evidence based ways to help them with what they're experiencing. And it takes the the onus off the physician to do something that they're not even that versed in in the first place, right? right? It's like, you know, if you don't have training in nutrition, you don't have there's no evidence for like long term weight loss. And so doctors are kind of casting about in the dark. I've heard so many doctors, you know, stories from clients or like having doctors of my own who are just like have their own personal recommendation. It's like, well, this is the diet that worked for me, but they don't know. They're, they're just, you know, it's not part of their practice. And so taking that onus off of doctors to even do something that they don't really know how to do so that right. they can get back to doing the things that they really are trained to do and great at that people need them for. 
It's so true. It's so true. Yes. And doctors have all, all kinds of different diet recommendations and they all recommend, you know, something different to the, <laughs> to the patients. And, um, and you're right. It's just something that we shouldn't be doing. But there are a lot of other great things that we can do to focus on individuals' health conditions um, and just take the, take the weight, body size out of the equation. Yes. Oh, so important. Well, I'm so glad you're out there doing this work and really grateful that your practice exists. I hope that many more practices like it, that you can help foster that around the country and the world so that we can have an army of Hayes physicians by, you know, the next time we talk. <laughs> yes, that's my goal too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Although I'll probably see you much sooner than that. But <laughs> right. Eventually we'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah, <laughs> totally. And it's, it's always heartening to me to know how many providers in training listen to this podcast and podcasts like it, you know, that are, they're absorbing this information and really doing the work to try to integrate all kinds of social justice stuff, including anti-weight stigma into their practices. So, yeah, I think that's a good point. I, I'm really hopeful for the for the young folks, you know, who are in med school and residency now, and of course, in other fields, too. I, I think that they're they will change things. I think they can see this in a different way. I totally agree. So how can people find you and learn more about your work, both if, you know, if they want to be patients, but also maybe if you have any resources for med students or other physicians to, to help educate them on this stuff? My practice is called Mosaic Comprehensive Care, and our website is mosaiccarenc.com. And you can find our practice on uh, Instagram and Facebook at Mosaic Comprehensive Care or on Twitter at Mosaic Care NC. And then my personal Instagram and Twitter is at Louise Metz MD. Uh, we do have, you know, some resources on our website. We have a document that we created with Lutz and Alexander Nutrition Therapy that is a, a good document for patients to take when they're advocating for themselves with other providers. And it really kind of breaks down some of the data. And so that's on our website and as well as some other resources about weight and health as well. That's great. We'll link to that in the show notes so people can find it. Having that kind of evidence-based one sheet to bring to the doctor, I think, is always so helpful because doctors also have so little time to spend with people. So if you can just like have one place that they can go to read some of the evidence and learn some of the basics, I think that's always good. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Well, I'm really excited that you're out there doing this work. And thank you so much for sharing all that you did and sharing your story with us. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. So that's our show. Thanks again so much to Louise Metz for joining us on this episode. And thanks to you for listening. If you're looking for some guidance to help you get started on the anti-diet path, grab my free audio guide, Seven Simple Strategies for Finding Peace and Freedom with Food. Just go to christyharrison.com slash strategies to get it. That's christyharrison.com slash strategies. If you've gotten something out of this podcast, please make sure to subscribe by going to christyharrison.com slash subscribe and get your friends and family to subscribe too. That's christyharrison.com slash subscribe. You can also leave us a nice rating and review in your podcast provider of choice, which is another way to help new people discover us and is always so appreciated. To get full show notes from this episode, including all the resources we discussed, plus a full transcript, just go to christyharrison.com slash 207. That's christyharrison.com slash 207. And to get the transcript, just scroll down to the bottom of the page and enter your email address. This episode was brought to you by my online course, Intuitive Eating Fundamentals. If you're ready to make peace with food, break free from diet culture, and reclaim the life it stole from you, learn more and sign up at christyharrison.com slash course. That's christyharrison.com slash course. A big thanks to our editor and sound engineer, Mike Lalonde, our community and content associate, Vinci Chue, and our administrative assistant, Julianne Watasek, for helping me out with all the moving parts that go into producing this show every week. Our album art was photographed by Abby Moore Photography and designed by Meredith Noble. And our theme song was written and performed by Carolyn Pennypacker Riggs. Thanks again for listening. And until next time, stay psyched. Stay psyched.